simple way to clap. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Lauren Salen. Dr. Salen is originally from Chicago. She received uh, both a bachelor's and master's in biology from uh, Florida Atlantic University, and she went on and attended the University of Chicago, where she received master's and PhD degrees in uh, biology. In her research, she uses big data analytics to study macroevolution with a focus on paleoichthyology. She was selected a TED Fellow in 2017 and a TED Senior Fellow in 2019. She is currently an assistant professor in both earth and environmental sciences and biology at the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Lauren Salen. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me because I, I was really excited to get an invite from Moscone given my background. All right, so let's see. Um, I think you have to mm -hmm. enable screen sharing. Yep, that's what I'm doing right now. Okay. I think that's how I make you host. Okay. Yeah. Screen. You should be able to go from there. All right. Now, show, start. Okay. So, like I said, feel free, um, can't really see the chat box anymore at the moment. So, feel free to ask questions by just unmuting in that case. And tonight I'll be talking about how carboniferous fossils reveal how fishes evolve and how they don't. So, I was initially invited to talk about the Tully monster, which I will be talking about at the end, but I feel like I also need to explain the other carboniferous fish stuff that I actually do before I get to that. So, basically, showing my credentials and evaluating whether something is actually a vertebrate. All right, so the reason I study fishes is because they're very diverse. So, for vertebrates, what most people think of, especially in the fossil record, are the tetrapods. So there's some 30,000 species of tetrapods. We're tetrapods, so they're near and dear to our hearts. But we're actually outnumbered by the fishes, especially the 33,000 species of rayfin fishes, which are everything from tuna to salmon to goldfish to anything you can basically think of. So there are a few other species of fishes as well. There are about 1,200 sharks. There's 120 jawless fishes and then some living fossils like coelacanths and lungfishes over here and lobefin fishes. So when we go to aquatic settings, things are even more lopsided. So of course, almost everything is a rayfin fish, specifically a teleost, and we have those same segments of other fishes still there, but we also have about 1,600 tetrapods, more or less. This is something I actually had to add up by going through Wikipedia. There is no list of like aquatic tetrapods. This is not a scientific number. So fishes are really, really diverse. And when we go into the fossil record, we find that they were even more diverse, especially in the Paleozoic. So in the Paleozoic, do we not only have our living groups of fishes like sharks or raven fishes, of course, tetrapods are over here, but we have a whole assortment of things that are no longer around today with all these little daggers. So jawless fish, armored fishes, placoderms, acanthodians, all of that fun stuff. And they also have a 400 million year fossil record. So they're really good for looking at long-term patterns and diversification, how things evolve, how they react to mass extinction and everything else. And the other thing, which again, I don't need to emphasize this group is that their fossils are really nice or can be really nice. And we can see details that are not always available from things like marine invertebrates or even tetrapods, which tend to be disarticulated. So we can see the shape outlines of their fins, which tell us something about swimming. We can see where their eyes are placed. We can see what their teeth are like. We can see their gut contents. It's just really easy to compare them to living fishes and infer things about their ecology. So the main reason for this talk, or the main reason I started looking at the Carboniferous is that if we go to a modern reef ecosystem, like I talked about before, most of the fishes there that we see are things like sharks or raven fishes. So we don't really see anything else there. And surprisingly, if you go back through the fossil record, this is true all the way back to the Mississippian. So here is Bear Gulch 323 million years ago in um, the Carboniferous. And despite slightly different shapes, everything in this picture is either a relative of a shark or more accurately a whole cephalon, which are today not that diverse, or raven fish. But if we go just a few million years earlier into the late Devonian into a similar reef ecosystem, in this case, 
Bad Wildingen, which is in Germany, everything is either an acanthodian, a low fin fish, or a placoderm. And they're filling the same ecological roles, they're just totally different. And so we want to know why did this happen and when did this happen? So first off, I'm going to be talking about the Carboniferous Rise of Modern Fishes, which is giving the game away a bit. And in the second part of this talk, I'll talk about the Carboniferous Origins of Modern Body Plans and things that violate vertebrate body plans and are not fishes. So looking at the Devonian again, this is the famous age of fishes from 419 to 359 million years ago. Here's another diorama which from actually the National Museum of Scotland, which is still there and is worth seeing. So it's one of the few museums that has like a whole fossil fish display with everything recreated instead of having a dinosaur display. Um, so these are all placoderms and lobin fishes and acanthodians again, all eating each other. And that's basically how it was through most of the Devonian. In fact, if we go to the very end of the Devonian, so to an ecosystem in this case um, in Russia, we find it's the same thing. We have a lot of very large, so here the scale bar is one meter, lobefin fishes, an early tetrapod, which is slurpiton, uh, some bottom dwelling placoderms over here, and just not a lot of what we would expect to see in modern ecosystems. So what happened exactly? Well, what happened exactly was mass extinction. So at the end of the Devonian, so this is not the late Devonian mass extinction, but the end Devonian mass extinction, which is a separate pulse and separate from the biotic crisis or anything else you might have heard of at 359 million years ago, is associated with a lot of different environmental problems. So here we have a sea level curve. You can see that sea level drops dramatically right at this extinction boundary, which is right here. So this is called the Hangenberg event. And you have anomalies in carbon isotopes and temperature and everything else. So it's just a really bad time to be a fish because basically sea levels fall off the continental shelf. So all those epicontinental seas like make up the Cleveland shale dry up. This that picture painting actually isn't of that, but I think it matches pretty well um, what happened. And in the place of something like the Cleveland shale, you end up with things like the Berea sandstone, which is terrestrial and actually has river valleys uh, carved into it. So it's a very weird time for marine ecosystems. And so at this extinction boundary, it turns out that 50% of major groups suddenly go extinct. So these are equivalents to things like, I don't know, birds or mammals or things of that rank equivalently. So they have a common ancestor, they all are found in faunas right up to the boundary right here, and then they go extinct. And the things that come through the extinction boundary are limited to say one or two survivors. They get through the extinction, there are shifts in habitat, so things that had been marine become entirely freshwater, um, like some holdout lungfishes right here. And you have diversification of other groups that come through which end up spreading out into both continental and marine waters. So ecological dominance changes as well in a very specific way. So if we again look at ecosystems right before the end Devonian mass extinction, it's again dominated by placoderms and lobefin fishes. But if we go to ecosystems immediately afterwards, well we have a few more lobefin fishes than we might expect today, which is here in purple. If you look at the ecosystems themselves, they are dominated by rainfin fishes, sharks, and aquatic tetrapods. And so the question is why? If everything comes through with one or two survivors, why do we have the fishes we have today? Why don't the lobefin fishes just start going again? Of course, the placoderms went completely extinct. So there are a couple, a few other weird things that happen after the mass extinction itself that give us some clue to what was going on. So if we look at things like size, and I have in the past, we see that there's a dramatic increase in the size of fishes over the Devonian, which is not driven by oxygen or temperature, but is actually, turns out this is for another talk, but is driven by ecological uh, competition. So it's completely directional. There's definitely a shift over 70 million years. But when we go into the aftermath of the mass extinction, the bulk of these surviving fishes get smaller which is really weird because this is a phenomenon known as Cope's rule, which you also see in mammals where things are supposed to get larger over time for whatever reason. 
this is an extension of what's called usually the Lilliput effect, where after mass extinctions, you have species that are much smaller than they used to be. Except in this case, it's prolonged through the whole Mississippian and things get even smaller. So what does that look like in terms of ecosystems? Well, whereas before, so this is again in the end of the, right before the end of Onian, we had a lot of very large fishes that belong to mostly extinct groups like lobefin fishes or these placoderms down here. In the immediate aftermath of the extinction, we find that all of, most of the large groups had been eliminated. So there are some large holdouts like this very large shark of all things right here. But then we see some differences in trends. So these things, the holdout lobefin fishes, actually tend to get larger over time as we move into the Visayan. So these are a phenomenon known as dead clades walking, where you have a group that persists after mass extinction but doesn't rediversify. So not everything that survives mass extinction actually thrives afterwards. Some of them become long-term victims or for all intents and purposes are already extinct. Whereas the ray fin fishes, which are in blue right here, start out very, very small. And then as you move through time, they start to diversify, taking on all of these new body shapes. So what we end up with is an ecosystem by 340 million years, this is about 20 million years after the mass extinction, that looks something like this, where instead of a lot of very large animals taking up all parts of the ecosystem, here's that same meter bar right here, Instead, we have a lot of very diverse small fishes, some of which are even sharks. So this, for example, is a whole cephalin. There are other sharks that are only maybe half a meter long, 10 centimeters long. Everything is very small. And then at the top of that ecosystem, you have this one holdout that looks like it belongs from a different time. So this, again, is that Sarcopterygian, the lobefin fish that is more like its relatives in the Devonian. So in the Carboniferous, we also see that we don't get direct replacement of the things that were lost. So whereas rayfin fishes had, the few rayfin fishes that had existed during the Devonian were more or less fish-shaped and not very interesting, afterwards we get a lot of things that we're familiar with today. So we get the first eel-like fishes, the first fishes that look like reef fishes, and a host of other features that have repeatedly evolved in rayfin fishes ever since then. And so we can look at how this plays out after the mass extinction as well. Why does this happen? Well, one of the ways we can do that is by looking at changes or disparity. So that's morphological diversification in heads and bodies following the mass extinction. And so what we see is that early on, or at least before the mass extinction, that diversity in both skulls and bodies of rayfin fishes had been very low. So they existed, they just, it's not like they were doing interesting things and just, just pushed out by placoderms. It's that they weren't doing anything interesting at all. They were mostly biters. Whereas afterwards, after the mass extinction, first they diversify their heads. So taking on new diets, moving their um, musculature around, uh, putting their eyes in new places, basically adapting to the new opportunities that have been opened up by mass extinction. And secondarily, they diversify in terms of their body shape. So they're becoming these eels and angelfishes and things like that. So it's sort of a two-step process that happens over a period of about 20 million years. So to emphasize from both the size trends, the diversity trends, and this, it takes about 20 million years for ecosystems to get back up and thriving after this mass extinction. So the first part of the Carboniferous, the Mississippian, ends up being a very critical interval for setting the stage for the future biodiversity that we see to today. And it happens in pretty different ways than we might be used to as well. So while we do see a lot of these shapes in modern ecosystems, so here are all the reef fishes that look like all the reef fishes we see back then. And then of course, these are the same shapes that we see throughout the fossil record after that. So these are all ray fin fishes from later. Here are carboniferous ones uh, that show up right after the mass extinction. So this one here, which is from Bear Gulch and looks like an eel. We have very deep bodied things like this. We have more regular fishes, we have predatory fishes. And then over here, these are teleos from Monte Bulka, which is Cenozoic that are showing basically the same shape convergently. So the space that's opened up by the Carboniferous rayfin fishes ends up being occupied by fishes from then on. 
And so when we go to a thriving Carboniferous ecosystem, it looks like both my background and this picture, where a lot of the fishes end up being shell crushers. They end up taking on shapes that look sort of familiar, but not quite. So it looks like a modern reef ecosystem, except the basis of the ecosystem is different because the corals had mostly been wiped out by the late Devonian mass extinction. And we have these fishes that look like modern stingrays, that look like modern eels and angel fishes, but are actually only distantly related to them. So doing the same jobs, but different groups. Right, so that gets us to part two. That's just a brief overview to orient ourselves in time about what we're looking at. And part two is looking more specifically at the fossils to determine how these modern body plans were developed. Why do we see them arise at this point? Where do they come from? Where do they originate? So I'm just going to show a couple examples of this, which is the other part of my research program. So one thing to, to understand is that until this mass extinction uh, was discovered, until um, I published on it in 2010, Carboniferous fishes didn't get a lot of attention uh, relative to other things. I think even in, in Maison Creek, they don't get as much attention as some of the other things that are found there. And that's really because there was nothing of interest. They look too similar to the things that we have today. So they don't look weird. They don't look primitive. They have hard scales, but they remind us of things that we're used to. And so most of the attention in terms of stud studies would go towards things like those holdout lobe fishes, the holdout acanthodians, and things like that. For the Carboniferous fishes, they were mostly put into groups based on their general form, that is their ecomorphology. So more or less every Paleozoic rayfin fish was shoved into this group, which is called Paleoniscoforms, or sometimes Paleoniscoids, which is basically just early fish, so fish-shaped fish. These are actually panels from Agassiz in his, um, in his fossil fishes volume, so he's sort of the father of paleoecology. And these groups are still used today. So he's naming these groups as groups. He's putting these things together. This is pre-Darwinian. This has nothing to do with their evolution. It's just based on their form. And so the deeper bodied ones are named platysomaforms after platysomus and all thought to be related to each other. So it's one exception to this general fish shape. And then later on with Moy Thomas in 1934, the eel-like things are all shoved together into this group called terraciforms. And so basically a lot of the effort has been to determine whether or not these are real groups and that given that there's a whole bunch of different reef fishes that aren't closely related today and a whole bunch of different eels that aren't closely related today, does it really make sense that each of these novel body forms only evolved once? And how did they evolve and why did they evolve? And of course the answer is no, they definitely evolved more than once. Um, but the main problem with figuring this out and the other reason Carboniferous fishes had been ignored is that the vast majority of them actually look like this. So those pictures that I showed you before, where they look all nice, those are very carefully curated. Most of them actually look horrible. So the Carboniferous being what it is, most fishes are sort of dark on dark slate of some kind, broken into a million pieces, smashed by the pressure of sitting underground for 320 million years or so. They're just not very nice to look at. They're not as nice as the Green River fishes or the Monte Bulka fishes or anything else that comes out looking very pretty. And so what you end up having to do is what they sort of lose in quality, they make up for in bulk. And so there tend to be a lot of specimens of the same fish that are preserved in different aspects. And so a lot of effort has to be spent in museum collections just trying to put these things back together. It's like the world's worst jigsaw puzzle where one has a skull root that looks okay, another one has cheekbones that look fine. There's an entire growth series. And so you have to figure out sort of okay, well, what age is this thing and what age is this other thing and try to get around all of the problems they present. But the payoff for doing that is actually really, really good because it turns out that fish taxonomy is actually even worse than it was assumed to be, which prevents us from understanding how evolution happened during this time period. So the first example of this is looking at these deep bodied fishes. As I said, the spoiler was that they do in fact evolved many separate times in the Carboniferous. And interestingly, deep bodied forms, which had not been around in the Devonian, not only do they evolve multiple times in the Rayfin fishes, but they also evolve multiple times in the cartilaginous fishes. So one weird thing about the Carboniferous that makes it different from today 
is that it wasn't only the rayfin fishes that are dominant now that were taking on these new forms. The cartilaginous fishes, the holocephalans, which today are only found in the deep sea and look pretty much like the painting behind me, like the one that's sitting on the crinoid, were also taking on reef fish roles. So most of them were less than a meter in length. You had eel-like holocephalans, you had deep-bodied holocephalans. They were, in fact, probably a limitation on reef and fish diversity during that time period. And of course, sharks don't do anything like this today. So this is actually a challenge to the whole concept that sharks are primitive or sharks represent some kind of early vertebrate stage or anything else. Sharks used to be really cool and now they only do one thing. And the answer to why that is, is something that my lab is looking into and might be the result of other mass extinctions. So getting back to the rayfin fishes, so the key to what, why their deep body starts with this not very good looking fish, which is Cyracopterus fulcratus, which is from a reef ecosystem in Scotland. So that's Glencardum, where a lot of these early fishes are from. Now it's been described a whole bunch of different times going back to the 1880s with Traquair. So here are the holotypes here and here are pictures of the holotypes as well next to that. There are some other terrible fossils that have been pictured. And so the interesting thing about Cyracopterus fulcratus is that it was supposed to be one species that existed for something like 15 million years. And so this is another problem with looking at the record is that to everyone, a single species existing for 15 million years is totally fine. But if you went to a living biologist and told them this species has been unchanged for 15 million years and it's found in two different places, they would say, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how things work. And indeed, that's not how things work. Because it turns out that if you go and pick through all those terrible fossils that are in the National Museum of Scotland or the Natural History Museum in London, this fish actually represents two distinct species that are about, say, in this estimation, about nine million years apart. So one is called Foldenia after the early Mississippian site where it's found, and the other one is called Styracopterus. And what's interesting about them is a few different things. One is that they have growth series, so you can actually see them grow from very tiny larvae that are only a few, a couple centimeters long, that don't have full development of their skull bones. And then as they grow, they become more flattened side to side, and they become deeper bodied. So they start to look something like wrasses. And they have a few other interesting features as well. So here's the ontogeny as I was talking about. So here's um, a juvenile Foldenia that's about four centimeters, doesn't have full development of the skull. It's missing most of its scales. Its fins have not grown out completely. Now, originally, the reason this is now called Foldenia and not Cyracopterus is because Foldenia was the name of the juvenile that was actually found first in the 1870s. So they found the juvenile, they found the adult later, and they said, oh, these two don't look anything alike and they're not the same size, so they must be two different species. But if you put everything together, you can see this growth series where they start out sort of very fish-shaped and then they become deeper bodied over time. And so that tells us something about the different growth trajectories of different parts of the body and gives us some insight into sort of how these deep body fishes developed and how they diversified. So here are a couple of pictures of Foldeni and Styracopterus. They're still closely related because they used to be one thing. And here's some other interesting features about them that I just wanted to point out. One is that they have this enameloid plating that develops during their ontogeny, so the juveniles don't have it, but the adults end up reinforcing their jaw bones with this thick enameloid, which is like the hard tissue on our own teeth. So that covers up the bones as they were and reinforces everything and grows outward from the jaws. The other interesting thing about these fishes, which hadn't been noted before, is that they actually have these very thick crushing tooth plates. So they don't have marginal dentition, sort of like we would expect in a fish or had been illustrated them be for them before, but instead they have these, what I'm calling maxillary teeth, where the tooth row is actually pushed up into the inside of the jaw, of the upper jaw. Whereas the palate, the entire palate is covered by these tooth plates that also have these denticles. So it seems to be adapted for shell crushing. So it's a deep body fish that's adapted for the kind of crinoids that it's living near. And so here's an illustration of what those tooth plates look like in both fishes. 
where they have this holdout teeth, but they've lost all of the marginal teeth from the lower jaw and all of the marginal teeth from the rest of the jaw and have replaced them with these tooth plates. So why, does that, why is that important? Well, it's important because it turns out that if you know those two characters, if you know that they have this enameloid plating and these tooth plates and this marginal tooth row, and then a whole host of other things that are found in the adults of Foldenia and Styracopteris, a whole bunch of other Carboniferous fishes end up having the same traits. And so we can finally split that deep bodied group platysomids up into the platysomids and the urinotiforms, which end up being a very persistent, widespread, deep bodied shell crushing group that includes even things like Amphicentrum, which is also found at Maison Creek. So these things persist all the way into the Permian, starting out from their earliest occurrences, which turn out to be these, this fish, Foldenia. So Foldenia is the earliest member of a really widespread reef dwelling clade that lasts for something like 100 million years. And it tells us that this early trajectory in ontogeny, where you see deepening of the skull and deepening of the body and movement of the placement of the fins and everything else, is what drives these massive changes in body forms that we see after that. Right, so moving on to the other example, which is more relevant uh, to the group here, we also have the appearance in several different places of fishes with elongate rostra. That is sort of movement of the front of their skull to extend out for various reasons. So we see that again, both in rayfin fishes. So here is a rayfin fish called Tannurinichthys which is from the Kinney Brick Quarry in New Mexico that I recently described with an undergrad, Jack Stack. Here's Phanerorhynchus, which looks like a sturgeon, which is found in the later Carboniferous about the same age. Um, so all of these things are pretty much Pennsylvanian, about the same age as Maison Creek, almost exactly the same age as Maison Creek. For these three, they're all found in coal measures. And Phanerorhynchus is found in the UK, whereas, of course, Bandrina is found at Maison Creek. So while these two rayfin fishes look like sturgeon, they are actually not related to sturgeon at all. So this suggests, again, we have convergent evolution of elongate rostra in a bunch of different groups. So what are those used for and how do they actually grow out? So getting to Vandria, which I actually described first. So as probably everybody here knows, Vandria used to be two species. So there was one that was found in the Essex fauna, which was Vandria rei. And then there was the one that was found in the braidwood fauna, which is, was Bandringa herdinae. So they come in two different forms. Bandringa rei was supposed to have this very elongate rostrum. Doesn't have much in the way of a skeleton. This is the holotype right here. Whereas Bandringa herdinae had a shorter rostrum, was maybe slightly larger, and had a fully preserved skeleton. Now, interestingly, Don Baird reported that in all the way, far away from Maison Creek, um, in the Canelton Coal um, of Ohio and then also in Pennsylvania, that there were these much larger, these much larger specimens that he also attributed to Bandrina. So whereas these are, of course, found in fully formed in nodules, the Bandrina that he found in these coal channels sort of in freshwater further upstream were like 100 times larger. And he found them in mass death layers. But they seem to have the same extended rostrum structure as the one that was found at Maison Creek. So it turns out that by looking at these species in detail, and also taking into account the fact that they come from two completely different environments, that the Essex is marine, that the Braidwood is freshwater brackish, that if you look at their features in detail, they're actually a single species, but being preserved over, under two entirely different taphonomic regimes. That is, the characteristics that are preserved are completely different in one, in one setting versus another. So while the ones that are preserved in the marine, they all show external features only. There's some remains of a tooth row, so that's that phosphate right here. You have preservation of the eyes and the eye pigment, but also the external pigment on the body, outlines of the fins, some actual um, fin spines, some actual denticles on the outside, and then some indication of sort of the sensory array that's in the front of this rostrum. 
Whereas if you go to the Braidwood fauna, the Bandrina that are preserved there show a completely different set. So as far as external goes, you have imprints of scales. You have some remnants of the skull and the jaws internally that you can actually see through there. You have preservation of the sensory canals. So spreading around the eye here, you have preservation of the nasal capsule. You have preservation of um, the otic capsule with the sand grains within it, which is how fishes orient themselves. And then you have preservation of the skeleton and imprints of the fin spines. So this is one of the rare instances in which you have an animal that's actually preserved in two different settings. So here's, um, so here's some more examples here. So you can see these are the fin spines um, for both uh, the ones preserved in the Essex and the one, an appeal of the one preserved in Braidwood that shows that it's pretty much the same fin spine just with the actual fin spine preserved here and then just the impression which matches exactly the morphology here. And so we get insight into the same animal from the inside to the outside, it's pigmentation just by having it preserved in two different settings. And here's a picture of all of the eyes of Vandrea where you can see that the one thing in common between the two settings is that you get preservation of not only the eye pigment, but also remnants of the sclerotic ring. That is all of the little eye plates that support the eye itself. And here is preservation of the rostrum. So we have the external rostrum, again, in, in the Essex fauna, where we see that there's this main cartilage that's supporting it. And then we have all of this sensory apparatus around, sort of like in a modern paddlefish. Whereas in the Braidwood fauna, what we see is that we have three distinct parts of the rostrum, and then also sensory canals and scales that spread forward. And then if we go back to those larger specimens that have been attributed to Bandringa, what we find is that it has the exact same cartilages. So this suggests that they are in fact Bandrina as well. Looking in more detail at Bandrina, we also find that it has some weird things um, that weren't noticed before. So it has some really weird scales, the sort of circular scales around um, its sensory canals, and then also these long needle-like scales on its cheek and on top of its head. So Bandrina was a really weird shark. And this is actually shark, not a whole cephalid. So it's related to modern sharks. And this is what it looks like overall once we put all of the material together. So it actually has protruding jaws. It's very sort of derived for a shark as well. And it tells us a lot about sharks at this time period. And so that's what it looks like reconstructed in Maison Creek. And so since then, we've looked at Tani rhinichthys, which is the rayfin fish from New Mexico as well. And that seems to have some of the same features convergently evolved. So it also has um, very thick scales and pointy scales as well, but as well as protruding jaw and an extended rostrum that seems to have a sensory canal that spreads across it and is made up of multiple features. So it's converged on Bandringa and it's the same age. And so what this suggests to us is that if we go to the Pennsylvania about 310 million years ago, that we still, far removed from the mass extinction, have a lot of convergence going on between different groups of fishes producing the same forms. So not only do we have elongate rostra in Tani rhinichthys and in Bandringa, but there's also an isolated elongate rostrumed um, raffin fish that's found in Indiana. So that was found by Poplin in 1978. And then we have Phanerorhynchus, the sturgeon-like fish over here in what's now the UK, which again evolves completely separately. So there's just a lot of convergence going on for a very long time. All right, so now that that's sort of background, I can get to the main question, which is what can't fish do? How do fish, how is, we know how fish evolve, we know how they converge, we know what they're capable of doing, what aren't they capable of doing? And so this gets back to some of the lessons learned from Bandrea and just from studies of other fishes. Um, to address something that seemingly popped out of nowhere as far as I was aware, and that is, is the Tully monster a vertebrate? So the first paper that came out in 2016 was a surprise to pretty much everybody who's a paleoichthyologist. 
So none of us had ever, even in looking at Bandringa, even in going to the Field Museum collections, and I've seen those specimens myself, had ever looked at the Tully monster and thought, okay, that looks like a vertebrate. Obviously, the Tully monster has been thrown around to different groups for a very long time. Um, more or less, its history seems to be you take it and you put it in your group. Um, at one point, it was affiliated with conodonts, but that was at a time when conodonts were not considered to be vertebrates, but considered to be polychaete worms before the actual conodont animal was discovered. So this was really a surprise, and it was more surprising because it seemed to be aligned with a lot better known um, vertebrates from Maison Creek, that it was nested closer to living lamprey than Maomizon. Now, of course, most of you have seen Maomizon. Maomizon looks exactly like a modern lamprey in pretty much every single way. Um, so this is sort of su a surprising result for phylogenetic analysis. And the reconstruction of the animal doesn't look all of that vertebrate either. So I had been actually been told by one of the authors shortly before this came out, oh, we're re-describing Tully monster about a week before this came. Um, we found that it's a vertebrate. And I thought that they meant that they had gone to the spoils piles, they had found that one fossil that unites everything, or the Tully monster is like, I don't know, in frontal view, if that's even possible at Maison Creek, and it had all vertebrate features. I did not know that they just went back and looked at the specimens again. And so we were sort of doubtful um, about this as a community. And of course, that wasn't the only paper that came out. So whereas this paper described the Tully monster as having a lot of vertebrate traits, including muscle blocks, including a three-part brain, including um, jaws with teeth, which is kind of weird because it's supposed to be a lamprey, and gill pouches and everything else and had reoriented it so the tail was in a different view and all of that good stuff. The other paper, which was from a vertebrate lab, didn't find any of those things. So the other paper says, oh, well, Tully monster is mostly, um, is mostly soft tissue. We don't see any vertebrate um, characteristics. We don't see gills, we don't see jaws, we don't see anything else. Instead, their argument was based on something else entirely. So they were saying, going off the work on Bandrea, is that we wouldn't expect any internal features to be preserved because of where the Tully monster is mostly found. That we wouldn't expect to find those things because of differences in preservation in different parts of Maison Creek. And so instead, their argument depended on these cells that are found within the eye. So Tully monster has eye pigment, just like Bandrina does, just like a lot of other things at Maison Creek do. And so the pigment sometimes preserves the outline of the cells that the pigment is found in. So the pigment within the retina, within the eyes of not only things like vertebrates, but things like mollusks actually can pre um, be preserved through this pigment. And so their argument was that when they looked at the eyes of the Tully monster under microscope, under an electron microscope, that they said that Tully monster had two layers of retinal cells. And that further that having two layers of retinal cells was a vertebrate characteristic. So there's, you know, this kind of cell and this other kind of cell over here. So what's interesting about that is that that had actually never been proposed as a vertebrate characteristic prior to this, but they compare it alongside an anchovy and so therefore maybe it's a vertebrate. So there's some interaction here so the first author of the other paper, Tori McCoy, was actually a postdoc in this lab at the time the paper came out. So it's sort of um, a complicated history. So getting back to what we know gets preserved at Maison Creek, how vertebrates actually look, myself and, and colleagues of mine um, throughout the vertebrate community, including uh, Philippe Janvier, who wrote the book Early Vertebrates, and Rob Sansom, who has worked on the taphonomy of lamprey um, extensively, went back and tried to figure out if this was plausible. So the first thing that we did is that we went through all of the Tully monster specimens pictured in both papers and then other Tully monster specimens and tried to do a full reconstruction of the animal. Because one of the things that we saw is that this paper doesn't have any reconstruction and this paper just has this sort of generalized schematic of the details that are there. 
And of course, when we're describing fossils, we want to know and map out exactly what we see. So this didn't have any particular hypothesis in mind. This is something that I did going through just to see, okay, what, do, what does the main specimen look like? Where do we actually see different features? And to try to do a reconstruction of that. And so what it shows is that the Tully monster is pretty weird. Of course, it has this extended proboscis. In their pictures of the tooth rows and sort of the feeding apparatus at the front end, there's actually this very deep crevice and this sort of overlap between what would be the lower jaw and the upper jaw, which is kind of sort of crab-like. Um, there's this other feature in phosphate or something over here. Couldn't quite figure out where that was. Um, then you go back and you have sort of one crescent and another crescent. They had said this was sort of like the opening at the, so the, so Lamprey had this thing called the nasal pharyngeal opening, um, which opens to the outside and is only for smelling. And so they said that that opening was like that. Um, there's sort of a white thing here, another white thing there. There's this complete bar that attaches to the eyes and the eyes seem to be kind of flattened. And the bar goes through either as an indent or as an actual unit that can be popped out, especially in the older papers, all the way across the head here. And then you have these segments that of course the Tully monster is famous for with this tube in the middle. And then these lines on the side way down with the holes that they were said were gill openings that are actually over the lines. So this is more or less um, a consensus view of all the evidence that's available. And so then from there, we can compare it to other likely candidates that it might be related to. So the first one, of course, is lamprey, since that's where it was assigned to. And it turned out that the tree that was used in the first paper, the evolutionary tree, was based on work by Rob Sansom. He found out that whoever made the tree had actually miscoded some of his, um, his lampreys. And so when he recoded just the lampreys, just fixed this mistakes, Tully monster popped out all over this tree. So in some parts, some of it, it was sort of like a stem vertebrate. So there's Pikea over here. In some, it was related to the nathostomes or the jawfishes. In some, it was related to hagfishes. Here is with Gilpicthes alone, which is also in doubt. Um, as a vertebrate. And then here's the original placement where it was within lamprey, here it's outside lamprey. But the basic problem with taking this approach is that this is only a tree of vertebrates. And so if you code the Tully monster for a tree of vertebrates, it has to come out as a vertebrate. So the way to do it is to actually have a tree of bilaterians, so all things that have two sides and a front and a back, and then see where it pops out. But of course, that's really hard because there's not a lot of shared characteristics between different things that are tubes that have a mouth and a back. So in comparison between the Tully monster and the lamprey, so this is an illustration of Maomizon right here showing some of the things that we would expect to be preserved. So it has sort of a nasal capsule, it has a vellum, which we don't um, see in the Tully monster. Um, the eye is heavily pigmented and round next to the skull, and it also has an otic capsule with the sand grains within it. So exactly like what we see in Vandrea, preserved even in the Essex fauna. So none of these things are actually observed in the Tully monster. And if we compare what Maomizon looks like to what the Tully monster looks like, there's really not a lot of matches. So there's a pigment line, which might be a lateral line. Um, on Maomizon. Of course, it's not internal because we only have external preservation of things in this fauna. Um, here are some gill openings here and an eye and some more pigmentation and that's all we see, which is why the other paper felt that they shouldn't really see any definitively vertebrate things. But if we look in the internal anatomy of lampreys um, compared to the Tully monster, it doesn't really work either. And there are a lot of reasons for this, which gets to the morphological problems with the Tully monster as a vertebrate. First of all, a lot of the vertebrate characteristics that were used to assign the Tully monster were sort of read the way that they're written rather than compared to actual vertebrates. So we have the segments on the Tully monster, which have flummoxed people forever. You can see they have these really wide septa and then this sort of bulging at the side, which you can see in fossils, and it goes all the way back. So these were interpreted as muscle blocks. Now the issue with this is that in vertebrates, as anyone who's eaten a filet of salmon knows, we don't actually have muscle blocks. 
in fishes, including going back um, to hagfish and to lamprey. Instead, the muscle blocks aren't blocks, but they're these overlapping V-shaped or W-shaped segments. And so they attach um, sort of in the middle towards the spine and then come outwards like a V. So in a view like this, they should not be shaped like this and they should not go across the backbone because they should be originating somewhere along here. So there's a little bit of septum up here as well. So it doesn't match what we know. And here's actually um, one of these pulled out in the salmon and you can see that sort of it's overlapped by other muscle blocks, many other muscle blocks for most of its length from its origin point internally. So that's one issue with that interpretation. The next one has to do with what the other segments are called, which is gill pouches, and just the way in which vertebrates breathe. So here we have an animal that has a really huge pharynx, so that is a really huge gill chamber from the way that it's been reconstructed that takes up most of its body length, if these are gill openings, which if you remember in Maomizon, the gill openings were only at the front end of the animal, so like in the cheek. And all of the water that must flow in to oxygenate the gill filaments within this animal has to flow through a straw that has a joint in it. So there's no indication on the Tully monster of workarounds that other vertebrates or other fishes use when they can't just bring water into their mouth and pump it over their gills. So some of them have spiracles, which are openings on the side. There's no evidence of that here. So it was an open question of how this thing would have even been able to breathe if it was in fact a vertebrate. But of course the other problem is morphological and that is just like the muscle blocks, the gill pouches and things like lamprey or the gill openings in sharks are also at an angle and they're only found in the bottom half and they don't match up with the muscle blocks. And so to, so to have sort of a dorsal view like this and have septa going all the way through seems really unlikely because if you remember from the hagfish, and lamprey, there should be different patterning up here than around where the actual gill openings are. But the main problem for the Tully monster is that the gill openings are actually on the septum. So they're on this part rather than being slits that are actually opening into the pharynx itself. So it wouldn't be able to um, breathe at all as it's been reconstructed. So of course there are other issues as well, looking still at the skull, and one is that the way that vertebrate jaws work, so of course it's supposed to be a lamprey, which is slightly different, um, so it shouldn't have a jaw joint at all. The Tully monster being a lamprey would assume that there was independent evolution of jaws within jawless fishes that was only a one-off at Maison Creek and then went away, and was, didn't even apply to all, all the Maison Creek um, vertebrates. Of course lamprey don't actually have tooth rows, so one of the things that was illustrated in the original paper was Pipiscus that showed these plates, but in lamprey, there's no rows. It's sort of like interdigitated um, in this circle. The other issue is the way that vertebrate jaws that even the lamprey um, lip works, which is that you have all of this musculature, which has to be attached to the skull to work. So because vertebrates have an internal skeleton, the muscles attach on the outside, which is different from how other animals work. And so if you look at this jaw, there is no place for muscle attachment at all. In fact, you have a joint that's internal that seems to be right in the middle of where it would feed, if it's actually jointed, which it was proposed in the original paper. And so the muscle attachments that we see across all vertebrates, both the jawless vertebrates and then homologous in the jawed vertebrates would have to be back here. So this is very, very derived and it's not clear how it would actually work. And then of course they have to have skull setups as well. So in both um, lamprey and in fishes, there's a lot of connections that are required to move these joints. So there's no such thing as a jaw that moves on its own. Um, in both jawless and jawed fishes or a mouth that moves on its own, it's always controlled by some other skeletal element that goes further back, like the piston cartilage or the jaw joint attachment to the skull that we see in sharks. So it would be a novel way of working as well. Of course, another minor issue with this is that um, if we look again at these very small flat eyes, there seems to be no place for the extrinsic eye muscles 
which are found in all vertebrates, including lamprey and hagfish. So it's not clear if it, even if it had camera eyes, which I can't really see even going further back, they seem to be more half circles. Um, there's no way to control its eyes at all. So you can't have all the extrinsic eye muscles going back through what seems to be um, a hard tube back into the skull. So another thing that was interpreted, I think, based on the description in the literature and not the actual sort of vertebrate morphology, the other thing used to identify the Tully monster was that it had a tripartite brain. So here's an illustration of that from the supplement of McCoy et al, um, where you have one part of the brain seems to be where um, this eye tube is going through, and then you have these two semicircles right here, and so it's a three-part brain. So we say it's a three-part brain because developmentally there are three different parts that become different things in vertebrates. But if you look at an actual lamprey brain, it's way more complex than that. It's not three distinct parts. There are parts developmentally, but they have um, the olfactory bulb, they have to have um, the otic capsule connected off the back, they're different sizes, there's a split because it's going to the two nostrils here. It's not simplified in that way. It's not, it, there's no brain in the record or even in development that looks like this. The other issue is that if we look at lampreys and we look at other vertebrates, you never see a brain like that because there's a ton of cranial nerves that are coming out. So the same cranial nerves that humans have, it would look like a mess. So in other jawless vertebrates where we actually have preservation of the brain parts, that's what we see. We see each and every one of these cranial nerves overlapping and sort of spidering out from the brain. And so if we have preservation of brain tissue, we should have preservation of cranial nerves as well. And yet we don't. And of course, this isn't even getting to the other problem, which is that it's very hard to imagine having internal preservation of the nerves without having preservation of the brain case. So the tripartite brain, the other reason that it's so complicated like this is that it's surrounded by cartilages in both lamprey and in jawed fishes. And so you would never see an exposed sort of simplified three-part brain like that. And in the Tully monster, because you have this hard tissue here, you would expect that if you had a brain case, you would be able to see the rest of it the way that it's preserved. Of course, as I said before, because of where the Tully monster is found taphonomically, we actually shouldn't see any skeleton at all, which is a problem for this entire um, unit. But just assuming that we could see the internal structures, we should expect a brain case um, to be preserved. Right, so that rules out basically all the characteristics that were used to assign the Tully monster. Now, what about the eye information? What about that evidence as Okay, assume the Tully monster doesn't have any vertebrate characteristics. What about the other paper, Clements et al., which tells us something about the eyes? Well, Clements et al. don't, Clements and colleagues did not put together phylogeny. Instead, they said, well, we think Tully monstrum could be a relative of vertebrate, so a stem vertebrate. Maybe it's related to nathostome, so they actually don't recover it as being a lamprey um, in looking at the eyes. But we think that it has a complex eye and it has several different tissue types and different pigments or whatever. But interestingly, in their own um, setup, they find that mollusks and some other invertebrates also have camera eyes and also have multiple types of eye cells. So that's setting up something very interesting, which I'll get back to. The other issue is that this is supposed to be a definitive vertebrate characteristic, but when they looked at the eyes of Bandria, they actually didn't find the two layers. So if you're just going by that as evidence, then Bandria is not a vertebrate. And if you can have gain and loss, and if you have the precursors already in other groups of animals, then it's not a definitive vertebrate character that is always found in vertebrates, even at Maison Creek. All right, so to quickly sum up, then that raises the question of what is the Tully monster? So what alternatives do we have if we've ruled out vertebrates? Well, now we've basically just thrown it back to the same state the Tully monster has been in for decades. So one possibility based on, let's say that the eye characteristics are real, that it has vertebrate specific pigment, that maybe it is a stem vertebrate. It could be something like a relative of a tunicate or a sea squirt where the larva um, 
have simpler segments and then they have everything at the front end and they're kind of weird anyway, or a cephalochorate like amphioxus, maybe, um, or even something like an early member of the deuterostomes, that is the group that includes vertebrates and echinoderms, like a vetulicolian. So interestingly, vetulicolians look the most like the Tully monsters, these are Cambrian things, of any of the deuterostomes, but They've recently been reassigned to mollusks. And then the discovery of this thing over here in the Cambrian, which is um, thought to be a very early Vitulicolian, doesn't actually have the characteristics that were used to assign Vitulicolians to vertebrates. So it lacks a tail. And then it's the more derived Vitulicolians that independently evolve the muscle blocks in the tail and the gill openings from the actual vertebrates. So it could just be convergent too. So this is the whole problem, is that there's a lot of conversion of so convergence of soft-bodied animals that goes on both in the fossil record and today. And so that brings up another option, which is, is the Tully monster a mollusk? So speaking of convergence, there's a group of mollusks called uh, heteropod gastropods, including this thing right here, which have no fossil record whatsoever, as far as we know, so we don't know how they preserve. But if we look at them, they, interest, they have several interesting features. They can have a proboscis that has a radula with teeth at the end of it. So that's right here, um, extending to the gut. They have a very complex eye, as shown here, that has a flat retina that would be preserved with pigment in the record as flat um, on the outside attached to a capsule. The eyes are joined by the optic nerve and the ganglia right here. So there's a lot of similarities. It also has independently evolved fins, just like fishes do. And it's really hard to pin down um, what it looks like because it's very soft. And so when it dies, it takes on all sorts of shapes from all sorts of different views. But it does look very much like the Tully monster. Now, I'm not going to make the same mistake that the authors of those papers did. I'm not an expert in mollusks, but there has been some intriguing evidence that suggests that this is the case. So this paper from Maria McNamara's lab, um, which came out last year, was explicitly trying to test whether or not the pigments in the Tully monster, assuming that everything else is the same, whether the pigments in the Tully monster and the melanosomes were really vertebrate. And so what they found looking at preserved um, members of different groups from Maison Creek, preserved uh, melanosomes from extant, uh, both mollusks. So in this case, they're not looking necessarily at the heteropods, which are actually really hard to catch, um, as it turns out, because they're deep sea, but also um, at modern lampreys, they found that most of the variants, so the way to read this graph is that this is the main axis of variation right here. So this is 96% of the variation in the data set. And what it shows is that the Maison Creek fossils, their melanosomes, their pigments, in terms of chemical signature and shape, are exactly like those that we see in modern lamprey and the ones in Chile Monstrum and um, in a potential, in a potential um, early cephalopod are just like octopus and things like that. So they're nearly identical. And so basically this paper went through review. It came out at proceeding speed, but Maria McNamara says that this is definitive proof that the Tully monster is actually a mollusk. And in fact, here they said that our study reveals that the eyes of extant cephalopods possess melanosomes with tissue-specific geometries. The collapse of the eye during decay could generate size-specific layers superficially similar to the vertebrate retina. And so along with the fact that we have a whole bunch of evidence to rule out a vertebrate affinity, there's actually an equal amount of evidence in the supplement to the McCoy et al. paper that suggests that originally they thought it was a mollusk as well. This seems to be a pretty good indicator that it's a mollusk. But of course, the fossil record is weird. We have things like vitulicolians. So whatever it is, it's not a vertebrate, but I don't know exactly what it is. Of course, the original, well, one set of original authors has actually given up in the face of this. So um, Mark Purnell, who is the senior author um, on the iPaper has actually told me that he no longer believes that 
the Tully monster is a vertebrate on the basis of this, that he doesn't see evidence for any of the other structures either. And he's done a lot of decay experiments and studies of the Maison Creek lamprey. Um, the McCoy set, so McCoy and her colleagues um, actually still argue that it is a vertebrate. So what they did is that they looked at the chemical signatures um, of different pigments in different Maison Creek animals and living animals and then tried to see if they were chitin, which is a mollusk um, tissue, or if they looked like they were keratin or collagen. So their results are actually more nonspecific than they're saying here. So they tried to show that there was a division between things that had chitin and then the Tully monster and vertebrates and then one um, worm over here that all sort of overlap on this axis. But what's interesting to note is that the first axis, the main variation in their data set, was actually from fossilization itself. So that's a confounding factor. And then if you look at this other analysis, so you read this chart the same way as the other one, there's actually complete overlap between keratin, collagen, and chitin for most of the variations. So there's no split whatsoever. So it's not a nice split like what we saw here where there's division on axis one um, between all lamprey and all mollusks. It's completely overlapped. So I think the jury is still out on whether or not this thing is a mollusk, but my sense is that there is, if it is a vertebrate, it basically rewrites everything that I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so. So in summary, this is why the Carboniferous fossil record is really interesting. It tells us a lot about fish evolution and a lot about how fish evolution doesn't work as well as it turns out. And it tells us how we got to the biodiversity that we have today. So thanks very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I do have a, a, a couple. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, um, it, it, there's really no verb material, but you were talking about the corals being uh, decimated after the, uh, the Devonian extinctions. Uh, down in Kentucky at the, in the uh, uh, Fort Payne, you have the carbonate mounds that act as, as a, a coral uh, core, more or less, with the green shales around it. Uh, and there you have the car, the uh, camera crinoids, which that one picture you had of the of the fish eating the crinoid, that's what it was eating is a ca uh, camera, and it, yeah. it kind of decimated the camerates. Yeah. Second thing yeah. is, I don't know, have you ever been down to see the uh, the Fort Payne? Uh, no, I haven't, unfortunately. Okay. I mean, well, I, fossils. Yeah. yeah, there's no, there's no, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of uh, echinoderms, uh, but uh, you know, obviously no, no vertebrates. Second thing is. Did you notice, or is it just for tetrapods, Romer's gap in the uh, lower Carboniferous? Um, yeah, so let's see. I don't know how far back I can go. So let's, um, I think you can still see my screen. So here we do see Romer's gap. Um, so that's what these dashed lines are. So Romer's Gap is not only um, in tetrapods, it's actually also in a lot of things that are in either deeper water or shallower water environments, so the other low fin fishes. Okay. And then if we look at the rest of the fishes, mm. it's a really low diversity time. So there aren't that many really, so these are all Tornasian faunas right here that have at least five species in three groups. We have a lot of widespread one-offs. We have a lot of shark tooth faunas. Um, that don't tell us uh, much about um, community structure. But overall, the faunas tend to be really low diversity and really homogenous, but they have a lot of biomass. So it's not like the fossils are missing, it's just that you mm -hmm. find like these mass death layers of rape and fishes, and it's the same rape and fish over and over and over again. Thank you. It was a very nice performance, very, very, very nice program. We really liked it. Thanks. <laughs> Especially the Tully Monster part. <laughs> That's the first time that I've gotten to talk about that paper. So I've been saying Tully Monsters is a uh, shellless mollusk for 50 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not original yes. to me, right? It was brought up in, in both of the, I mean, in the Maison Creek books. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. 
So you mentioned that the the jaws all kind of look like a you know crab or something like that. Could it at all be possible that that's exactly what it is, and that the it may have, especially with the bend in the uh, proboscis there, that could that be used at all to feed back into a mouth where you've got those uh, semicircle. Parts. Yes. Yeah. So that's something that we considered. Um, so one of the things that gives us pause is that the senior author on the original paper was Derek Briggs. And so if it was an arthropod, like we assume that they would know that. And so if he's already ruled out arthropod and other arthropod paleontologists I've talked to have ruled out arthropods, of course, I think that their reasons for ruling out arthropods are actually weaker <laughs> than the reasons for, um, that I, for ruling out vertebrates. But yeah, you can see that there's, a, there's an opening here and then this line, the lines, whatever they are, kind of end at this point. So to me, it's possible that it's something like, like opabinia or a holdout like that and that this isn't actually the mouth at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, that's up for debate at the moment. We need nice to that, people to look again. Thanks. That mollus that you showed, though, is pretty... Pretty interesting though, though too with the proboscis like it has so who knows. Yeah. Great yeah, presentation. Like I said, that was proposed decades ago, um, but I think that these things are relatively understudied, so that might be one of the reasons. And they don't have their own fossil record, so unlike comparison to you know arthropods or even Mayomizon, we don't know how these would fossilize. We don't know what it would look like, and then you still have you know, 310 million year gap between these two things. Question? Yeah. Um, I was always interested in uh, when, you, when you talk about trilobites and the, the, the whole different variety of eyes and how some, some of them will be like a little higher up from the body and whether they were burrowing or whatever the case may be. When you have something like the Tully monster with these 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 extended long tubes or whatever you want to call them with the eyes at the end um, is 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 there any kind of view of like what what how would this animal what was it doing with those eyes so far out away from the body right I mean yeah it's hard um so, I mean, there, there are reasons for that, right? And it, it probably does help it see further or around it because this thing might be a predator. Um, so there's actually a picture of the 3D structure in one of the older papers on this, which I couldn't, um, unfortunately, I couldn't find before this talk because I'm at home too. Um, but it, it seems to be like a puckered circle. So it's not, so that's the one thing is that the eyes don't look arthropod. So they aren't, uh, they don't have multiple lenses or anything like that. There does seem to be a center and then a cup around it, which is something that both mollusks and vertebrates, well, not vertebrates, but deuterostomes have generated. So they don't seem to be camera eyes. I'm not sure why. Um, and in fact, I, you know, it's not clear to me why they say that they're camera eyes, because if you look at a real camera eye, like, like Vandringa, it's, it's really like hefty <laughs> right, because you have to have the light going into the to the uh, retina at the back um, whereas in the Tully monster it's really flat like even in the pictures in the two papers mm. interesting great talk thanks uh, is there a greater diversity of sharks across the, the Hangenberg event um, yeah, so, so sharks were actually also pretty rare um, in the Devonian. And so they diversify just like um, the ray fin fishes and the tetrapods do. So like I said before, the sharks, but also holocephalans, which were also cartilaginous fishes and more dominant then, take up like 50% or more of some of, uh, especially these marine settings. So all of these reds are different kinds. Um, 
of shark of cartilaginous fishes right here. So sharks have really, I mean, they were still about 50% um, based on the preliminary data that we have going even into the Cretaceous extinction, and they've just kind of petered out since then for whatever reason. Um, part of it is that fishes have diversified a lot over the Cenozoic, but part of it is that sharks just don't do a lot of the same things that they used to. And they've gotten a lot larger as well. But going across that end Devonian event, they got smaller like everything else did? Yes, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't. Um, so you have within the groups too, you have these same patterns where you have a few large sharks, like this one, that get larger in our holdouts. But otherwise, um, the vast majority of at least the diversifying groups actually get significantly smaller. So they have a regression line that pretty much matches this, which is um, shown in the, the paper, which was in science in 2015, but not shown here. So the reason, one reason that I ask is that I do a lot of uh, dissolving of uh, Mississippian and Pennsylvanian matrix in acid to get the denticles and teeth out. And many of the teeth are extremely small, and it's hard to imagine an animal that goes along with one of these teeth, something like a Culiella or some of the Xenocanthomorphs or something like that. They're, they're really tiny. You know, yeah. what sort of a, a niche does an animal that's, you know, that big fill uh, when it's got little, little tiny teeth to it, what could it grab onto? See, so the, the fishes are very small too. So this is a log scale. Um, so you can see the fishes are shrinking like down to 10 centimeters. So this is the mean right here and the bulk are actually down here at the 10 centimeter mark. Um, so it could be grabbing onto things like that. There's also juveniles. Um, so one of the things I forgot to mention about Bandrina that was brought up by it being associated with the ones in Ohio and Pennsylvania is that the Maison Creek ones are juveniles. There's actually a fossil that Bob uh, Masick has that has like um, a yolk sac <laughs> hmm. attached. And then I saw a preliminary paper and I don't know what happened to it where it was coming out of Paleozyrus. Hmm. So it was actually hatching out of the egg, um, which in the paper I point out that is associated with these kinds of sharks, so probably belongs to Bandrea. But instead of migrating from this nursery out to sea, Bandrea migrates upstream through these oxbow lakes, through the coal deposits in that giant Carboniferous um, stream system, all the way to Ohio and Pennsylvania from the, from the coastline. So it's possible that some of the tiny teeth of things like xenocants that you're finding, because xenocants do end up being relatively larger so they're kind of filling that same like top freshwater predator um, niche that seems to be an exception. Some of them might be juveniles. And the, the denticles are on Bendringer, are those absolutely unique? Because sharks have so many denticle characteristics they seem to have conserved over, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of years. They all look the same basically today as they used to back yeah. in, in the Devonian. Um, so this interdigitation of the base is pretty unique. I, there's only a couple other sharks in the fossil record that have that, but I don't have any evidence of the needle-like extensions um, that we see along the, the cheeks and the top of the head. Otherwise, these kind of denticles, like these kind of triangles, they're just sort of overlapped. That's a pretty common Paleozoic form. Um, and then even these circle scales over the sensory canals, we actually also see that in, in Stethocanthus and Echinacean for some reason, um, even though it's not closely related to that. So there's also a lot of convergence that goes on in sharks because the scales help with water flow and sort of um, overcoming drag in the water. And so there's been a lot of uh, investigation by especially George Wilder's lab at Harvard where he's going through 3D printing scales from different sharks in different parts of their body and then testing to see sort of how they control flow. See why you get these shapes. Okay, thank you. Uh, did I hear you say that the uh, sand grain uh, is what they use to orient? Is that what it evolved to today in people that have like a crystal? Uh, in their brain for uh, for balance, and uh, also, what would be the mineral content of that sand grain? So, so it is calcium carbonate. Um, so, in sharks, they may actually swallow sand 
to put into their inner ear um, to orient themselves. And bony fishes, instead they have an otolith, which is sort of bone that grows out um, that helps them orient. And then ours um, are basically the same thing where we orient ourselves based on um, the movement sort of through the inner ear in the semicircular canals. So it gives some sense of your position in 3D space to have something moving around in fluid independently inside your inner ear. Thank you. Welcome. So we're going to the, uh, the Mississippi and Cheney limestone tomorrow and uh, wow. <laughs> um, in, uh, in South Central Michigan. Um, it's, uh, it's a mixture, sandstone, shale, limestone sort of thing. Uh, have you heard of any vertebrate remains coming from there? I can tell you right now, I'm going to grab some chunks and throw them in the acid as soon as I come home and, you know, see what I find. But have you ever seen any fossils come out of their vertebrate? Uh, no, I haven't actually. So I, so um, Jack Stack, who's now at Michigan State, used to be in my lab and he used to go out hunting with Paleo Joe and the friends of the University of Michigan Paleontology Museum. Um, but they found mostly Devonian. They didn't really go looking for Mississippians, so I never heard, and I didn't see anything in the collections either um, at Michigan from there. And I haven't well. seen any papers either, but there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been looked at. Um, so I should mention that as paleoecthiologists are, so our community is very small. Um, so there's only maybe a dozen active labs across the world, maybe a little bit more than that. So we're really dependent on avocational paleontologists to go out there and find things for us and report it back um, so that we know where to look because there's just there's so many fishes and there's so few of us. I know that around here some of the guys find uh, uh, things in the black shale. Um, I've seen uh, some beautiful uh, Inneopterygians uh, from the black shale and uh, also a, a really nice shark tail that appears to have been bitten off like so many of the others you know also appear to have been bitten off um they, they're really they're preserved well of course they're piratized but um that's one of the things that we find around here in the in the illinois basin wow i i mean so that that's exactly the kind of thing that i'm talking about so i i did my phd with mike coates at the university of chicago who studies especially early holocephalans and any opterygians. Of course, uh, Zangaril found a lot of this stuff, but otherwise we haven't gotten any new fossils in a while from close to where we were actually based. Hmm. Uh, is Keith on here? I don't. Keith is here. Keith is here. Is it okay if I show pictures of... Uh of the Inneopterygian? Of which? The Inneopterygian, the golden flying fish. Uh, I don't recall having one. Well, you have the shark tail, right? Uh, spiny, spiny. No, it's uh, not an acanthodian. You, you have the shark tail. You gave me the square shark tail, right? Oh, you're talking the black shale. Yes. Okay. I was thinking the Zonia, not, uh, not that site. Yes, go ahead. Be my guest. All right. So, uh, okay, I Jeff. Can stop sharing. <laughs> For the relocation center, I showed some Zonia. Jeff, can you give me the screen? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. A sec. Uh, let's see. You'll have to, your host now, now you can go ahead and share. Thank you very much. Those are the continents. I'm going to be able to enjoy this. I'll take it to some of the other sites. 
And I hope that I didn't leave anybody out. I couldn't actually see the chat or the controls while I was presenting, <laughs> as it turns out. Uh, we were we were able to get it in the background. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I tried. We tried to bring you, and then we saw you couldn't. That you weren't able to see it. So if we bring it out another way. Yeah. Great talk. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> so I assume that's a uh, centimeter scale down there, the sort of standard scale in the lower left. So you can see, you can get an idea how big this thing is. You can see yeah. this, right? Okay. Wow, that's really nice. Um, it's not mine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think this needs to be brought to the attention of Mike Coates, um, just because he's working um, with carboniferous holocephalins and any apterygians. Like, so they're doing CT scans in his lab, yeah. and he's been reconstructing them. Um, but the fact that he's so nearby as well. Yeah, there was a, a postdoc from there, Tom, uh, I can't think of his last name. Um, he gave us a program several months ago, and uh, he's in uh, Neil Shubin's lab, I believe. Yeah, and, yeah, so um, Tom Stewart. Um, he Tom actually, Stewart, yes. Yeah, so he used to yeah. be in Mike's lab for his uh, PhD. Yeah, so he saw this. He's seen this one in person. Very nice. <laughs> And that's uh, something Keith, this is Keith's, right? Or, yeah, this is Keith's. This one has to be prepared yet, but you can see the um, the wings here and the, the spine going that direction. Nice. Nice. Oh. And there's the, the bitten off tail. Wow. So there are a few things that, that are local here that uh, might be of interest. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just we don't find a lot of skeletal material. And so the sites that produce skeletal material, so for, for example, Bear Gulch, which used to produce a lot of, of this stuff, is pretty much off limits now. Um, so there's been a lot of work being done at Kinney Brick Quarry and reopening that. Um, which has produced some chimeroids and aneapterygians. And so I know, like, John Paul Hodnett, for example, um, has been describing those with Mike. So I think that it would be worth opening this up. <laughs> I'm actually going to email him and tell him that he needs to contact you guys and possibly give a presentation so that... Uh, he can come look at the stuff too because I'm not sure if Tom can bait it or not. Um, the, the location that all these came from is, is the same general area and I have one too that's a that's a bony fish that's in, in terrible condition which they a lot of them seem to be spread out all over the place. Yeah. Um, but uh, they're from a quarry uh, or from that same area. And that quarry we're still hoping to turn into a, a fossil park, but uh, that, that remains to be seen. And it's probably a couple of years down the road because of delays and with COVID and um, uh, monetary issues involved in, in setting up a new park. But if they would allow us to, that shale is extremely uh, fossiliferous and it's very, it's very um, easy to split as well. If you go a mile to the east, the shale gets extremely hard and blocky and it only fractures conchoidally and you can't split the layers for anything. Even though we know there are things in there, we have acanthodian spines that, that we see and, and we have other, other things that come out of it, but you just can't split it for anything. So if this fossil park goes, goes through, it would be a great thing. So where where is this exactly and what, I mean, in general, um, in what age is it? Um, by the old terminology, it's Missourian. It's the bond formation. Um, it's the old Lone Star Quarry. 
uh, near Oglesby, Illinois. Yeah. That's now owned by the state of Illinois and is being turned into a park by the DNR. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for, for showing me these. I'm, I'm excited about what's going to come out of there. Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's a beautiful fossil. It really <laughs> is. Can't. Keith, did you ever get yours uh, prepared? Uh, not yet. That one. Uh, that that previous one was Rob Coleman's. This is right. mine. Right. Right. This one's yours. I was wondering if you ever got this prepared. No, I did release some surface material in scales and parts we're showing. Okay. But it hasn't been prepared yet. Okay. So what do I need to do to turn the screen over here? And also here, the Greek city of Ephesus, which has been beautifully restored. Here it is, the library of Celsius. It was the third largest ancient world in the reading world. All right, Jeff, you back in control here. Might look beautiful now, but in the 1970s, it was just how rusty. Can't hear you, Jeff. We're hardly off the beaten track here. Okay, nice, Bill. The there. Yeah, I think we got it back before we got everybody, everybody showing. So, um, again, Lauren, great, great presentation. Thank yes. you very much. Yes. For Thank you, Lauren. Very nice. Thanks. To the, Lauren. Uh, <laughs> Lauren, do you have the uh, the Ascone books on Mazan Creek? Um, I have one of them. See, this is the thing. I haven't had access to my lab um, for six months. Ouch. Yeah. So I have like the the big illustrated one, but not the but not the smaller one. <laughs> Well, do you, do you know if you have plants or animals? Um, I have like the, the overall illustrated one um, by Mateki. Oh, okay. Oh. Going way back. No. Yeah. I don't have any recent anything. <laughs> ah, okay. We could probably fix that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there's some, there's some good books. You can put that Jack's got out there. You can uh, definitely work something out there. Thanks. That would be really useful. Um, like I said, mine are sort of out of date at this point. Okay. Well, actually, uh, Jack Wittry, who wrote uh, the last three Mizzine Creek books, um, told me in an email the other day that uh, he has uh, done the very first work on a new volume of the animal book, which I think came out in 2000, what, six or something like that? Anyone know? Anyway, he said it, it might take him a while. I think he said 10 years to forever, but he, at least he's done, he's done the first, uh, the first work on it. So he's, he's uh, back in the, back in the groove. He has to do that because he did it for the plants. You got to keep it symmetrical. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it, it is. is. What it is. <laughs> so I guess uh, any any. Other topics people wanna people wanna go over here tonight. The floor is open. If I have a minute, can you get me in, Mr. Don? Get you in. Do, oh, do you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah. We hear you. Yeah. I I don't. The uh, camera didn't turn on, so I don't know what's the problem. But that's your all then. Just a question, Lauren. Uh, the evolution of the eyes is always kind of an interesting question. Do you have a picture of 
how the eyes developed in fishes and uh, the significance of that? Um, so let's see. So it shows it on that, um, on the one telly monster face about the eyes. So let's see if I can share that. I can't share it right now. Thank you. I'll make me host again. There you go. Just give me one second. Okay, you should be able to share another. Okay, so here's sort of an illustration about how eyes develop um, across different groups. Um, so there are shared genes that actually control eye evolution across them. But the way that eyes develop in general is if you see um, the outgroups that is the relatives of vertebrates that it starts as sort of a pigment cup. So first there's sort of like a light detecting cell that shows up at, at the surface. Then it kind of becomes a cup so that the light is focused into a single area. So these are the kind of eyes that like the Tully monster has. Um, and then once uh, it reaches a certain level of complexity, um, it becomes a camera eye where there's a small opening, which controls how much light actually comes in and then that centers it. Um, unfortunately, I actually have to go uh, <laughs> this time because um, even though it's Friday night, we're not really on schedules anymore. My kids have just come in because it's like 1040. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thanks again. Thanks again for yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. But Great thanks job. for inviting me. And if anybody has any other questions, just email me. I'd love to see more carboniferous fossils. I'm definitely going to email um, my coats about getting um, in touch with you guys about these Neopterygians in this new site because I think that it could be really productive. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Night. Bye. Bye. Oh, I'm still the host, so. Bye. Um, I'm the host? No, no. There we go. Come on. Come on now. There we go. Dave, you look like you're in the Marianas Trench. Hi, <laughs> hey Dave. You should stop the recording now. It's actually on automatic. I don't know if it'll let me I'll try. Yeah, I got Or whoever has control. <laughs>